Welcome to Physiology Bites. Today we're going to talk about the processes which cause muscle contraction. Now broadly we can term this EC coupling, which stands for excitation contraction coupling. Now what this is what this is saying is how is it that excitation or ac action potentials from our nervous system can cause the contraction of muscle? We're going to fill in those blanks today and talk about what causes muscle contraction, starting with fat activation from the motor neuron. So you're you've decided you want to contract your muscle. You might be running, walking, or you just want to stand in the same spot. You're going to activate some skeletal muscle. In order to do that, your motor neuron will cause the release of acetylcholine, which for skeletal muscle is excitatory with these receptors. And acetylcholine will bind to these acetylcholine receptors. Once they bind to those receptors, sodium will start to move into the skeletal muscle and start to depolarize the muscle. And we call this area of the muscle the motor end plate. Now, once we have this depolarization, what this means is we start getting the propagation of action potentials going across the muscle. So it spreads across the cell membrane, and it will then keep going, but it will also go down the T-tubules. Now, these T-tubules are infolds into the myofibrils, which are the contractile element of the muscle. And so what this means is, by having these T-tubules, when action potentials spread down here, they can spread down multiple parts of the muscle. But let's focus on what happens when that action potential now spreads down. An action potential will activate this receptor here, called the dihydropyridine receptor. Now this acts like a triple wire, which is electrically activated. So when the action potential comes along, it becomes active. In its activated state, it'll interact with the ryanidine receptor on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. When these two combine, what that ends up causing is the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So now this calcium is going to leave sarcoplasmic reticulum, thanks to these ryanidine receptors, and go to the sarcomere. Because the sarcomere is the part of muscle where the actual contraction occurs. And so now this calcium, which has moved into our sarcomere, is going to do something very specific. It's going to bind to a particular protein called troponin. Now why does that matter? Why does that lead to activation? It's because when there's no calcium around, what normally happens is that this orange rope-like protein called tropomyosin sits usually on top of the actin binding sites. And this is because troponin isn't being activated by calcium. However, when calcium comes along, it binds directly to troponin. By activating that troponin, Troponin will then talk to tropomyosin, and tropomyosin will move out of the way, so all these little actin, actin binding sites in the blue here are now available. What this means is the actin can now bind to the head of myosin, of the thick filament. When the myosin head binds to the thick filament, uh, so when the myosin head binds to the thin filament, uh, moves this way, and by doing so, will move the entire thin filament with it. And of course, when, when this happens across multiple myosin heads, and many times over, that's how we get a sustained muscle contraction and generation of force. So you can see how, if we take it back to the beginning, electrical impulses in the form of action potentials from the nervous system will cause an action potential to spread across the muscle, leading to release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and that calcium release is the thing which allows for myosin to interact with our thin filaments and muscle contraction to occur. So that's Physiology Bites, all right, thank you.